Anyhow, Trump, very interesting, polarizing figure. All of a sudden, back in the news again, I do understand November's around the corner, of course. It's like clockwork. But here we are, back to this Jan 6 nonsense, man, which was a psyop uh, on its own. Total psyop. So we got Trump, man. Um, Trump issued January 6th subpoena. Orchestrated effort to overturn, overturn 2020 election. Um clearly trump has in my view been used to, to kick this whole thing off right he's kind of started started the war as it were um it's my belief that he is uh, he he's the introduction of mrna biotech okay so like if we're going to be honest here he rolled out through operation warp speed he initiated the american people the west and i would even say the earth initiated them into the biosecurity state therapy technology mrna this can't be ignored. This can't be denied. And uh, uh, I, I think it's ironic that you'll find many of these Republicans that just want to brush that under the table. Yes, uh, the biosecurity came in through the conservative, the conservative right. And it is my belief, possibly, I could be wrong, that we see the technocracy standardized through conservatism. But it's not true social conservatism. It's this fake technocratic transhumanist conservatism under the thumb of, uh, say, Peter Thiel. Uh, they don't really stand for much but money at the end of the day and we understand that's just another arm of the entire system the holistic system of systems so trump brings in the mrna biotech and this is a transhumanist uh, transhuman uh, software and he and and so what what i'm seeing here is all of these conservative characters being used to usher in new austerity or new technocratic technology uh, Trump started it off with the tech, but also with the with the silencing through hate speech and all of this stuff. Uh, the end of free speech, the end of privacy. We're losing all of our rights through the actions of these conservative players, which is just so fascinating to me. And I personally believe it's all by design, being harnessed and being directed and being nudged and guided and funded. Uh, and it's interesting how how yay is uh formerly Kanye West is playing into this as well I can't help but uh, pay close attention to it and we're going to really dig into that in a moment here and as well as Musk they all play their role in this new conservative right or new right that's developing on the internet and social media mind you none of this would be possible if it wasn't for the programming and condition conditioning power that social media and ubiquitous devices have right now Let's see here and then we could look at uh alex jones who plays into this as well all of this is happening at once and they're all conservative figures it's interesting what i'm gathering and again a lot of my ideas they're real time and i'm working them out through these shows with you guys right so, so you know who really knows how all of this is panning out? i'm not going to sit here and act like i know right i could just try to give my best perspective and view and these can change and i'm always open to change so we have this the, the candy book family seek to to steep punitive damages after one billion Alex Jones verdict. They're, I heard they're asking for like two trillion or some crazy crap like that. Total psyop, man. There's no way this is reality, and it's so hyperbolic. And I think what we're seeing is, in a sense, this <clears throat> sacrifice of of human indiv or Western quote unquote Western individualism. With that bathwater goes the baby. So if quote-unquote white supremacy if quote-unquote patriarchy and all of these these red herrings and straw men ad homs if all of these are the bathwater, unfortunately the christian worldview and the christian faith is the baby and that's by design in my view because what you'll discover is all of these individuals claim christianity except musk who is in my view the atheist angle the secular angle the appeal the appeal to the tech tech culture right we'll get there we'll get there so we have we have jones who was also a big proponent or at least a supporter of of uh trump right trump kicking the door down and starting this whole technocratic rush over his uh his presidency and then we have another lawsuit now all of a sudden we have we have the oncoming helter skelter potentially with the whole revisiting of the george floyd situation which was a total psyop to sidetrack the whole scamdemic and bring in that other element of social justice as world economic forum had discussed in their uh article i showed you a second ago now 
to add to this, it, it appears the Kanye situation is very, very complex. There's so many angles to it. There's many things working at once. I tried my best to go over those in my last show. There's more to it than that. I Trust me, I barely got through the surface of what I'd like to say about this situation, but we'll work into it as time goes on. Things will develop. Uh, but what I see is, at least in part, West is definitely being used uh, to bring in some type of speech reform from my perspective. I see the same thing happening with Trump, Jones, and now Ye. Uh, speech reform, possibly. And again, this could be a nothing burger. They could brush it under the table like they do with most things. You know, just shut up, don't talk about the Jays, and keep it moving. Or maybe they say, you know what, we're going to put a stop to this and we're going to actually reform speech and create some type of new regulatory platforms, etc. Now, with that, we also see Balenciaga fashion house cuts ties with Ye. So now he's he's lost his biggest project with Balenciaga, which is just like very uh, prestigious, you know, fashion nonsense company. Uh, Vogue also dropped him today. I, I didn't have time to pull the article, but Vogue dropped him today too. So what I'm seeing interestingly is everyone's cutting ties with him. Uh, now, it's, it's a, a fascinating thing because I think this goes back to the Jones situation where, you know, you, you step over the line, you say too much, you don't stay, you know, in your, your little box, you get debanked, right? You get cut out of society. You, you get depersoned on the internet. Like, like, well, Jones didn't really get depersoned, right? I think a lot of these, like, personally, again, I could be wrong, but I, I think a lot of this censorship is designed. Here's another one. So we have Balenciaga, Vogue. So we got we got Kanye being silenced again. We're seeing this whole like free speech thing. What's gonna come of all of this, right? It's pretty interesting. That's why I think the the Yay situation is really important, in part because of what he's saying. It's kind of a little. <laughs> Do you see the recent Pierce Morgan one? It's like this, he's calling him a boy and telling him to shut up, and it's comedy. It's it's kind of funny. It's it's starting to look very theatrical at this point. But again, there's always that potential that Ye is just kind of an eccentric dude that's just, they're letting him hang himself with his own rope, possibly uh, fighting MK Ultra programming and uh, possibly medicated. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't believe for a second that he's bipolar or has a mental illness. That's always something they like to pin on people that think a little different or behave a little different. But I do believe he has been medicated and, and these these drugs do things to the brain. They do things to the spirit, right? So we could see a spiritual battle happening right now by design, right? This could be an indirect controlled opposition situation. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't lean towards this concept that he knows exactly what he's doing. And I do understand that he's, he's, he admitted it. He sold his soul, you know, um, in that, in that track. And, and I think that was a lot more real than some people wish to believe. Um, and he's he's definitely not uh, portraying uh, the faith, right? But when one considers that all he's been through as far as programming, I think it would be expected. But we always have to be able to look at things in multiple ways without landing on anything, especially when we don't know, right? So either way, this is all by design being worked towards something. That's that's my that's my conclusion, especially when I look at the tech angle. That's where we're gonna go, and things start looking a lot more clear for me there. Right. A lot of this stuff is is more murky, but the tech stuff, black and white, day and night, very, very obvious. Now, we have this Newsmax. Newsmax drops Laura Logan after comments about Satan, migrants, and blood-drinking globalists. Now, we don't talk about blood-drinking globalists, though we do understand that there's some elements of these things that would seem to be true, especially when we look at the Ambrosia Company, for instance, that I think Peter Thiel was involved with. And many other, many other creepy stories and rabbit holes that we don't really spend much time on, but are legitimate to a degree. Of course, this feeds into the QAnon, which is another massive in intelligent psyop, part of the whole Trump psyop. So we get it. But again, here it is. Satan. Hmm, what does that relate to? I think that relates to Christianity, right? Oh, you're talking about Satan. You're talking about demons. You're crazy. You Christians are insane. You guys are mentally ill. You're not living in reality. You see where this is going? Uh, we have to make laws against that kind of thinking, those kinds of words. Now you can't work. You can't be associated or affiliated with people that think these ways, thought crimes. 
Migrants, mm, interesting, right? We have to bow down to the universalism, the collectivism, the multiculturalism of the technocracy where they don't really care about people. They don't really care about culture and health. They just want everybody together under one umbrella, one dome that they can control with their little technological trinkets. At the end of the day, that's their goal. And then they have to bring in the hyperbole with blood drinking globalists. And for me, it looks like we're really moving towards this full on redistribution of knowledge, uh, reformation of speech, and in a sense, like the, the full on removal of tradition and, and any Christian ideal in the mainstream. It, it, it seems to be slowly being pushed away. And they're utilizing the conservative movement and conservative figures to do so, unfortunately. Uh, Trump subpoena. So back to Trump here. Oh, now let's talk a little bit about Peter Thiel. Because what I want to show here is how, and we, we've talked about this, but I want to remind you guys, the conservatives, the Republican Party, they're just as, they're the other side of the technocracy, right? In fact, I think based on the research that I do, man, most of the people behind the, the cutting edge tech, especially the funding, our conservatives, our Republicans. The left is more concerned. They're not the left, by the way. It's this hyper progressive, super modern culture. It's not the left as it were in the past. It's this new progressive movement. They're about culture. They're, they're, they're about uh, sexuality and identity. See, the, the right, the new right, this, this conservative right, they're about technology and business. So when you think about technocracy, it's really about technology and business. The culture, the identity part is just a way to, in a sense, condition society and the public to accept the new world that's coming. Uh, the, the conservatives, the Republican Party is building and funding a lot of this technology, man. So I know we get we could talk all day about these progressives because they're crazy, clearly. I mean, you look at the trans stuff with the kids and everything, I mean... We haven't even touched on that yet. I got crazy stuff to go into when it comes to the recent uh, transition culture we have right now. So that that's coming. We're going to get everybody. Anybody can get it here, okay? We're, I don't even call myself a centrist because even that's corrupt. You got these Tim Pools and I don't even have any of those labels. I ain't on nobody's team. I'm on Christ's team. That's it. Christ. That's the only team I'm on, I'm on. through Christ under the most high God, right? I'm not left, right, center, none of that. Anybody can get it, and everybody will get it, trust me. All right, Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel donating 1.25 million to Donald Trump's campaign. So he's, I, I believe, the biggest donor for the Trump administration. Now Kanye West to buy conservative social platform, Parler. I'm showing you all these to put, you know, dots, connect dots, okay? Parler after being restricted on Twitter, Instagram. So, hmm, now we had the, the in the past, the Kanye Trump situation, right? Now he's going to Parler, social media, social media, communication, technology, devices, application, okay? We had Trump, Truth Social, Technology, application, conservatism, connection there. Oh, wait, we have Elon Musk, X app, Twitter, social media, social media, communication, application, conservatism. Mm, you see how it's all connecting here, right? Now, let's continue. An unholy alliance between Ye, Musk, and Trump. What do you get? What do you get the contrarian billionaire who has everything? Try a social network to call their own. Mm. Look, guys, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, right? I hate to be the, the Debbie Downer. I just call myself a realist when it comes to a lot of this stuff. Yet I'm also an idealist as well, right? Of course. I think every believer, everyone in the faith is to a degree an idealist, right? Because we seek the ideal doesn't mean we can't address the real, Okay. Now, for me, this is looking like on the heels or on the backs, on the neck of conservatism, we're going to be transitioning into the new social paradigm, the new technocratic social paradigm. And they are, apparently, it looks as if 
They're going to start structuring an escape plan for those who want free speech, an escape plan for those who want to be able to speak their truth. But this will just be, again, another Xanatos gambit, another direction. Right when you think you're going in a direction where you win, it's already set up for you to lose in that the same people behind the other side are behind the new side. We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, what do we have next? Oh, Elon Musk made his first millions in the PayPal mafia. Guess who that's guess who that is beside him? Yes, none other than Peter Thiel, right? The billionaire PayPal co-founder. Okay. Connecting the Republican conservative technocrat of the century with, of course, Elon Musk. They go back. They got history, guys. They got history. Not only do they have financial uh, business history, they share a worldview. They're both transhumanists. Yes. Both transhumanists. Now, here we are. PayPal founder Peter Thiel amassed five billion fortune in Roth IRA. Tax leak reveals. Just, just evidence, you know, just some evidence here. Yes, yes, yes. Where where are we? What is this? Oh, Center for Genetics and Society. Could this be the home? Literally the home of genomics, or at least one of them. Yes, remarkable ambitions of Peter Thiel. Let's get into it. Peter Thiel is not just a tech billionaire, not just a far-right libertarian, not just a transhumanist, and not just the co-founder of Palantir. Mm, remember Palantir? We've done many shows on Palantir, part of the, this whole uh, Skynet, right? Plays a role in uh, Metaverse, also directly connected to DARPA. High-level technological development going on here. Okay, I'm talking about space age sci-fi stuff. Not just a co-founder of Palantir, a creepy company that analyzes personal data for governments, hmm, and presumably keeps a copy. He is also the Silicon Valley mogul who most ardently supported and financed Donald Trump in 2016, ever, ever speaking at the Republican convention. All right, just more evidence for you guys, seeing who we're dealing with here. I'm trying to reveal the systematic development of a transhumanist society. And it is my belief that biosecurity, or should we say uh, therapies, technologies, and uh, genomics are, are going to be the way they accomplish this. Um, and now let's look at how they're going to, in a sense, appeal to Christianity. Because as I've stated, what I'm seeing is the development of technocracy and transhumanism through the conservative right. We all understand conservatism somewhere in its roots has a foundation of Christian values. So if this culture, if this conservatism is to survive into this new transhumanist world, it has to find some way to bring Christianity with it because it's in a sense, it's moral foundation, right? And it grounds its moral views, okay? How are they going to do that? No other way than equating transhumanism to Christianity. Let's take a look. The thing that's, that is striking on the sort of transhumanist versus Christian thing is how similar they are. And so I, I think you can, you can sort of point to metaphysical differences, but, uh, but uh, the thing that sort of is always striking is you're going to have a transformed body, uh, you know, there's going to be this radical transformation of the way everything works, there will be no more random freak accidents that happen to kill you. Um. So the technologists who are developing transhuman technology to help us live forever by uploading into the machines are gods and they're ushering in heaven on earth wow thanks for delivering us i think the thing that's that is striking on the sort of transhumanist versus christian thing is how similar they are and so i, I think you can you can sort of point to metaphysical differences but, uh, but uh, the thing that sort of is always striking is you're going to have a transformed body. Uh, you know, there's going to be this radical transformation of the way everything works. There will be no more random freak accidents that happen to kill you. Um, so the tech who are well, developing well, well, transhuman well. technology. What do you know? Right? It's, they're the same. 
See, uh, and I showed you recently the transhumanist movement of, in Mormonism. And there, their goal is to harness technology such that they can, in, in a sense, bring uh, justice and peace to humanity. And in, in a way, they make this argument that God has provided us this technology, right, to, to bring peace on earth. It's really creepy stuff. We'll, we'll return to that eventually. Um, now, before we get into the X-Men, I want to show you this here, just as my perspective of engineering the new right. And I know a lot of people might not be familiar with some of these characters. Uh, as someone who studies culture, I'm very aware of all the movements going on right now, politically, socially, culturally, especially on the internet, Gen Z culture, etc. I'm very aware of these things because it's what I study. So I'm going to show you just a very uh, a basic uh, image here of, of what I think is being developed through this new, this engineering of the new right. Okay. So here we have an image here. And this represents what I believe is this type of influencer, ba influencer based, technological based uh, shift towards this new type of rightist movement that's going to develop a type of of uh, a type of quasi uh, conservative movement, quasi in that it's not necessarily authentic, and definitely not inorganic. And I've seen this development over the past year, just with specific individuals, uh, especially someone like Andrew Tate, uh, who is a supporter of Trump, regardless of what truths he says and all of these things, it's very obvious how he works into this, even if it's unbeknownst to him. I'm not saying he's, he's one of these guys that is acting and knows what he's doing. That possibly could be true, but I could see just from like a 30,000 you know, foot perspective, bird's eye view looking down, I could see how all of these guys are in a sense creating this, this type of uh, almost a, a shape, right? They're, they're creating a form, right? And, I, and I'm watching this form move. And with tapes specifically, I see him ushering in a new youth culture of uh, cryptocurrency, a new crypto, crypto bro culture. Uh, and I do understand Cryptocurrency might actually be the future for many of us. Uh, there might be no other way to survive. I'm not you know, naive. I, I do understand the development, but I'm leaning more towards uh, options in, in uh, currency tech, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a universal Fed coin or some type of C CBDC. Uh, it would be cool to see different types of currencies that we can use and have a little semblance of freedom. I just doubt it. I doubt it. I personally believe the infrastructure is being built up by its use, especially with something like Bitcoin, which I personally believe is going to be eradicated. It's going to be pushed out. It's going to be useless at one point. And then they're just going to say, these are the only acceptable and approved digital currencies that will allow to purchase things. Now, there will be black markets as there always are. And I think we might have to be functioning in those para economies. So what is it to say that cryptocurrency is bad wholly uh, or solely, or sh should I say in its, in its, I, I'm basically what I'm saying there, there might be options. Okay. I don't know, but I, I definitely see Tate playing this role, also playing this kind of conservative uh, manosphere. And there's the whole gender angle, right? He's producing this false sense of masculinity, which is creating all types of uh, damage that already exists by way of the gender war, but he's huge here. A very recent uh, character here, and I'm sure maybe many might not be familiar, but it's uh, this guy, uh, Sneeko, that's next to him. A very young kid. He's like 23 or something. But he's kind of went into this deep dive into like the, the Fuentes world. And he's really inspired. He's young and angry, you know, like a lot of young men are today. I totally understand their views. But they just know so little. They're easily moved by things that sound good or that make sense to them or that appease or appeal to their emotions or possibly their genitals, for instance. But overall, it's, it's, very, uh, it's a ton of a naivete, and there's a lot of uh, innocence, of course, but far more ignorance than anything else. But he's very influential, has a huge following, very, very viral with the younger gen. And he's kind of joining forces with this. And then, of course, we have the recent Bannon stuff, which is huge. This is more for the, the, boomer, gen, the boomer population, as well as Jones uh, down here, as well as Trump, of course. And what we have is, of course, the the cultural icon, which is Pepe, Pepe, right? So he's the cultural icon, the meme, the meme power, right? Memetics, right? We can go all the way back to to uh, to uh, goodness, not Darwin, but uh, uh, Dawkins. Sorry, not Dar Darwin, but Dawkins, right? So again, it always kind of starts in materialism, which we're, we're going to get there. We're going to get there, especially when we address the X Men. 
So, and then we have Musk, who is this kind of new libertarian, I call the anti-hero conservative, not necessarily traditionally conservative, but bringing this dark horse, this dark horse vibe, this anti-hero vibe that's very likable, very appealing, especially to the libertarian. He always talks about decentralization and all of this new cutting edge technology that is very popular today. But at the same time, he is playing into the grand scheme of rightist technocracy. And then we have, of course, the 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 original originator of the Gen Z um, conservative movement as far as the internet culture is concerned, and that's Nick Fuentes, who doesn't really speak a whole lot on technocracy. He's very, very surface level. He's pretty much just like a political pundit but uh, very influential, uh, very, very, uh, almost like a poster child for this new right that's coming out of the internet. And I'm not going to straw man him or ad hom him about what people call him a Nazi and all that nonsense. I understand that's just uh, hyper progressive tools to attack and to prop up their view opposed to others. And then we have uh, here, this is Yang, Andrew Yang, who isn't technically a conservative, more, more so a uh, a Democrat, I'd say, or at least libertarian. But what he did was fascinating because with the Yang gang and his movement, uh, many didn't realize it, but he was actually one of the first to introduce the concept of UBI to the younger generations. It's my view, and it always has been, that his, his concept of UBI and automation and acceleration were big psychological, uh, cultural pieces of propaganda that were used to influence and, in a sense, initiate the Generation Z into these new technocratic uh, futures that we're, we're now accepting, okay? So he's definitely, he has a huge part in this. So these are just some of the characters. There's many others. There's like that Zuby guy, he took the jab and also plays this kind of fake pseudo conservative dude. I mean, it's it's just very clear, very surface level information these guys have, just basic logical arguments that they make. They don't really get into anything that's actually means anything. Uh, they just play on that surface political social identity level. And then, of course, we have Ye, uh, Ye right? We have Ye, who has play, played into this with the Trump, but also he's the, the biggest cultural uh, influencer in the world, the most popular man on earth, I would say, and uh, has so much culture power, it can't even be described. And he is now part of this movement by way of his, his rightist or what some would call conservative connections. Now, interestingly enough, he it, it, it appears as if he's become... He's gotten into this almost as a contrarian, right? He's like, you can't tell me what to think. And I understand that, you know, you, you can't tell me I can't wear this hat, so I'm going to wear it. You can't tell me I can't like this Trump guy, so I'm going to like him. I understand that. But unfortunately, this whole contrarian view, this whole speaking truth, which is great, great in many ways, is feeding into what I believe is this engineering of a new right, but not just a new right, but a technocratic right, even if it's unbeknownst to some of these players, right? Some of these, especially some of these young guys who have no idea. They're just trying to figure out their futures, man. They're just trying to create some way of employment for themselves. They're, they're trying to create some, some, you know, financial options for themselves. I mean, we're in a really trying time, right? So they're, 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 you know, grabbing onto any of this, this new tech and this, these new markets and coins and stuff. It's, it's, it's a way out for them. I, I understand that. Only if they knew. Only if they knew what was coming, what was developing through their behaviors, through their support, through their actions, right? So I just wanted to show you that to give a visual of what I think is coming. Now let me read a few notes here and then we're going to keep it moving. We're going to get into X-Men, okay? Um, so we have Trump, mRNA, biotech, transhuman uh, software, graphene, nanolipids, nanolipid particles, he introduced the earth to uh, graphene nanolipid particles, okay? Big deal. <laughs> You're talking about, tr you, you, if you want to talk about just a basic transhumanist technology of, say, the 21st century, there you go. Who introduced it? The conservative right. Um, and all this is for biodigital convergence. So Trump was the initiation into the biodigital convergence, convergence under the guise of a scamdemic, under the guise of some fake garbage, quote unquote, pandemic that is killing millions of people. Yeah. And his, his, uh, he represents traditional or tradition and Americana, from my view. Um, a side of his is Peter Thiel, of course big influence and then he also has a social media platform truth social so what i discover here is that 
all of these conservative guys, they're all moving towards a, a social media, but it's logical in that they're being silenced. So there's always that logic there that makes sense. So it provides a type of uh, plausible deniability of any wrongdoing. It's like, well, we're being silenced. So what do you think I'm going to do? What's the first thing people say? Oh, build your own platform. Okay, well, we're going to go build our own platform. Makes sense. It's logical. But when you discover that these individuals are being, in, in fact, funded, um, informed, and uh, affiliated with transhumanists, then you discover the whole concept of data mining, uh, data-driven epistemology. Then you think of, about things like the X app and this, you know, one app to rule them all, you know, like Lord of the Rings, in fact. It start, things start to look a, a little strange. You, you start to think, well, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> then we have Yay. I look, so if Trump is the mRNA biotech transhuman software, kind of president of it all, pioneer right yay is the creative team department of this movement right he's the creative team department he's the cultural influence specifically with hip-hop which is the the biggest cultural movement that exists um, he has a spiritual power i believe yay does in that he claims to be a christian um, clearly fighting a spiritual battle uh, he provides a type of spiritual power what that spirit is, I'm not going to claim I know just yet. I'm not going to say it's the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to say it's not. But it's clearly a spiritual battle going on in that man. And I believe he is very spiritually powerful, whether it's white, black magic, who knows, right? But the, he, there's a spiritual element with him, a spiritual power. <clears throat> and he represents the marketing and advertisement. So once this occurs, once these technologies start coming out, if these guys team up, because it, they're already teaming up just by their own words, right? but also through their worldviews, through these kind of conservative, rightist type of perspectives. And Ye is probably the least conservative of them all, obviously, right? And I would even argue he doesn't even believe in a lot of the, the, the political perspectives. He's more so teaming up with this, this movement because it is the black sheep of society. And he is, in a sense, a black sheep himself. So he's just going where he feels comfortable. The, the rightists, the traditionalists tend to be the contrarians today, tend, tend to be the anti-heroes, right? And for good reason. Uh, so it makes sense that he aligns himself with this group, opposed to the status quo, the hyper-progressive uh, madness that we see in, in the mainstream today. So there's always a logical purpose here. A lot of this stuff makes sense why they do what they do, but there's a subtext. There's a subtext, and I, and I try to reveal that to my best ability. So marketing advertisement and pop culture icon, huge. He's the Michael Jackson of this era. He's the Michael Jackson of our generations, or at least of the younger generations. Michael Jackson was my Michael Jackson, right? <laughs> um, and he's the technical voice, okay? So he's the technical voice for Christians and the religious. So if Trump is the traditional Americana or the conservative political voice, Trump being the conservative political voice, yay, yay is the technical voice or the Christian voice or the cultural voice, religious voice. He brings in the religious element. Now, let's talk about Musk a little bit. Musk, if Trump is the mRNA biotech pioneer, if yay is the creative team department, who's Musk? Musk is the biodigital convergence engineer. He's the engineer. But he's also the visionary, right? He's also the visionary. Of course, Ye is a visionary as well, but his cultural influence is much more prominent. I also uh, look at Musk as the Newton, the Newton of our time or the Newton of supermodernity. Now, of course, that's probably a bit exaggerated, but you see where I'm going with this. He aims to change mankind in ways that Newton did. He's an innovator and a designer. Ye is an innovator and designer as well in his own right, but it's in a different area. Musk will be literally innovating, or at least assisting in the innovation and the design of all of these new technologies that are coming. He's done it already through Starlink, through Neuralink, Boring Company, Tesla, etc. cetera. Uh, automator and accelerator, okay? If Ye is marketing and advertisement in the pop culture icon, Musk is the automator and the accelerator and the tech culture icon. If Ye appeals to not just the black culture, but the pop culture, to the religious culture, to the Christian culture, Musk appeals to the tech culture, to the secular, atheistic, agnostic, secular 
technological culture of today. The tech heads, the tech geeks, the techies, and all of the rest. Everyone has a seat at the table, see? When you have these individuals working as one, the real X-Men. If Trump is tradition, Americana, politics, if Ye is Christian, religious, technical voice, new age, black, then Musk is atheist, secular, technocratic, new age, foreigner, key, foreign angle, universalism, quote unquote globalism. You also include the foreign body as well. This is how we get a universal removal of nation state, removal of nationality. Got the black guy, got the good old American guy from, say, you know, <laughs> referring to that era of making America great, that great era, allegedly. And then you got the foreigner. South Af Africa, African, he's an African, <laughs> you know, but new age, right? New age. And I call, I call yay new age because he's part of the new age, not new age in mysticism movement, but, but the new age hip hop culture, the, the new age black as it were, right? That's, that's a whole other topic we won't have time to get into. And I know there's shades of that too. There's different shades of the new age black as well. There's different sides of that as well, but anyhow. Um, Ye is connected or at least influenced by Ray Kurzweil. This is a very, very big connection here. Ye is very influenced by Ye, uh, Ray Kurzweil, transhumanist, one of the premier transhumanist philosophers, at least. Trump has Peter Thiel. And Musk don't need anybody. <laughs> He's the anti-hero. He's the dark horse. Uh, he is the dark horse. Now let's talk about their connection to social media, okay? All of them are bringing out their own social media platforms, all under the guise of free speech, which is needed and warranted right now. The problem is there's a logical conclusion to this type of technology, especially when you add in the Musk angle and what he wants to do. Who do you think is going to control this development? Trump? Yay? Do you think Trump or Ye is going to tell Musk anything about technology? Absolutely not. You know who's in the driver's seat. Okay. Twitter, X app. Trump has Truth Social. Ye might get Parler. He also has something else here. Are we ready for that yet? Let me bring this up. We're not ready for that yet. We're going to save this. We're going to go into the X Men here. Okay. X Men. All right. Yes, let's go into X Men. So, check this out. Elon Musk posts, then deletes a meme showing him, Trump, and Kanye West as the three musketeers, each with their own social network. Now, you all maybe not are familiar with, uh, I think it was Tuesday, I posted uh, another one of these memes that Musk deleted, but it was a meme, a Dragon Ball Z meme, of Musk and Ye kind of joining forces. And for me, and, and he had like a Twitter sign and Ye had a parlor sign. It's just, it was, it was blatant to me what that was. I have so much to say about that. We won't be able to get into it as much today. We're going to touch on quite a bit though. Uh, but that I posted that in the community as a preface to some of this stuff, because I, I think I see where this is going. I, I believe I see what, what's building up behind, behind this culture and social and, controversy okay um let me check if we're even still live because i can't see the chat so let me see if you guys are even here let's see um, what happened to it oh there it is is that it no nope, that's not it hold up where are you guys where's the chat what happened to the chat? Okay, we're still on. <clears throat> Restore chat. There we go. All right, I see you guys. I see you guys. 
All right. Wow. This thing's moving. Okay. All right. I see you guys. Cool. Lady of the Woods. Good to see you. Natasha Morales again. Good to see you. All right. All right. We're all here. Yeah. Full house today. Welcome. Welcome. And we're just getting going, guys. I'm, I'm not even kidding. We're just getting started. I have so much. So let me close this down and jump right back into this. And I will return and we'll, we'll chat a little bit about some of these things, but I got to get all of this stuff out. Um, all right. So now let me pull this up for you guys. So I posted that just to kind of preface some of these ideas and also show that this is happening. Uh, whether it's by design or or by you know some some type of spiritual movement, it's happening. Now there's another one that he posted, and this one hits even harder. Boom, there it is. All right now, what I see here, a lot of people are coming up with different perspectives of, of what this this symbolically is. That the problem with symbolism is it's subjective. See, a lot of people, a lot of people ground their arguments in symbolism. First off, that's not logical. That's not logic. So you can't make an argument because it's subjective. So it's relative. So it's, it's invalid, right? Um, that's a problem with grounding all of your views and theories in, in symbols alone, okay? Now, what I see here symbolically is an X. An X for X app, okay? That's where all of this is going. X means a lot of things. And, and there's people have been coming up with all kinds of theories for what this represents. Not X. That's the most obvious one, I'd say. But people are coming up with all kinds of stuff. And that's fine. But just as long as they know that it's purely subjective. <laughs> it's, it's no different from having an emotional argument, honestly. So, you know, just got to call a spade a spade. Anyhow, um, this is X to me. And this represents the X app. And this is the ultimate goal. And I'm going to try to present to you today how I see these things lining up and what could be what could be the conclusion to this whole yay Musk Trump thing. And I know X alone means so many things. Yeah, Gen X, X unknown, X marks the spot. There's the occult uh, history behind X, Trinity. I mean, there's so many different things, right? So many things. Either way, this is big. Very esoteric, very symbolic. This is big. And I'm just going to try to provide some ways to look at it, at least from my view. So let's see what's next. So now, so this, when I see X, when I think of X app, I think of X-Men. The real X-Men. And why do I say real? Because they're not a Marvel comic, for one. Right? They're not a Marvel comic. But they also relate to a different X-Men. Someone will say it in the chat. Not traditionally known as the X-Men, but the X-Club. All right? Now let's look at it. Before we go there, though, I want to talk about what I believe Musk is working towards with his X app, with his biodigital convergence by way of Neuralink. He's working towards one aspect of this. Well, we have telekinesis. We have cyberkinesis. We also have technokinesis, all relating to a similar idea of man-machine processing, fluidity. Fluid man machine processing. Okay. That is, that's Musk's goal. Yeah, SpaceX is another one. That's Musk's goal. Let's look at what technokinesis is. Of course, of course, it's a it's it's a, a concept a, a fantasy concept straight out of video games, of course, and comic books. Technokinesis is the power to manipulate technology. This ability can be manifested as a special form. Actually, you can't even see that, huh? as a special form of electrical tel telekinetic manipulation, which allows telekinetic interaction with machines or even a psychic ability that allows for mental interface with computer data. 
You know what, guys? This is off of like a video game fandom thing. This is this is straight kid stuff. This is science fiction. What I'm gleaning this from. But guess what? It isn't science fiction to Musk. No. He wants to make this a reality. Yeah. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Marvel. Technokinetic transmutation. Okay. Just showing you how these things are comic book based. Hence, X-Men. The real X-Men. It's happening. LT, you better believe it. Occult stained glass in the house. Matrix, yeah. Of sorts. Lawnmower Man. Jason X, man. Shout out to Jason X. Lawnmower Man. We've covered it many times here. One of the classics. One of the introductions to the whole concept of Metaverse. I remember I went to the theater at, at, at least twice, maybe even three times to see that when I was a kid. I was young. I loved it. It was crazy. It was weird. But I was like, hmm, this is pretty fascinating. Oh, yeah, of course. You have to beat all the X-Men. Yeah, man. Cyborgs, cybernetic organism, transhumanism as the political and cultural and technological introduction to cybernetics. Yes, guys, it is legitimately happening. Whilst everyone's talking about this and arguing about that on the internet, we got the development of this stuff. We, we They're turning this, this place into a damn comic book, man. Whilst they're releasing film after film based on comic books, live action, comic book entertainment, all by design, predictive programming. Skinnerian conditioning. Now, yeah, let's continue. Yes. Remember I said X-Men, originally known historically as the X-Club. What is the X-Club? This is Thomas Huxley. X-Force. Yeah, I really liked X-Force. Actually, I liked X-Force a lot better than X-Men once it came out. That might not be a very popular idea but x-force was pretty cool cable and like uh shatterstar Psh, shatterstar was raw i mean just oh man i know everyone's not a fan but rob liefeld had some crazy crazy style i was really into it trust me so here we are the original x club where it all began where it all began yeah x clan is another way to put it who is this guy? This is the father of Julian Huxley. Yes. Julian Huxley. He who coined transhumanism, the original transhumanist, the mere concept of transhumanism. Julian Huxley, yeah. This is his father. Julian Huxley, but guess who else is included here? Yes, Aldous. Aldous Huxley. The fam bam. Okay, the author of Brave New World. But I would add to that, also the inventor, or at least the innovator and influencer of the human potential, the human potential movement, which is related to MK Ultra, related to Esalon Institute, and this whole '60s CIA '60s uh, counterculture movement. The, this family alone, these three men, are so influential in everything we're experiencing today everything we're most familiar with aldous simply through his writings especially brave new world depths of uh, doors of perception for instance right he was one of the the pioneers of of the acid trips which led to the mk ultra acid tests he was actually a huge part of that whole program and Ra ayn rand uh, the objectivist well uh that's a whole other conversation. Just her philosophy alone is, is narcissism. So uh, objectivism leads to a technocratic, uh, hyper-capitalist society rooted in, in corruption and dominance. But that's another discussion. Julian Huxley, very, very, very influential, a eugenics pioneer as well as a transhumanist pioneer, extreme racist. Uh, Huxley, Aldous Huxley wrote The Doors of Perception. 
And of course, now we're talking about their father because their father started it all. He started the X Club. Yeah, the X Club. A great book for this. Those interested in um, learning about this, this group is the Ruth Barton work, the X Club, Power and Authority in Victorian Science. These guys, this club, uh, again, uh, Thomas Huxley was also called uh, Darwin's Bulldog. So he, he, in a sense, was a right-hand man, a henchman for Charles Darwin. So you understand that this is where materialism, eugenics, genetic determinism, all of these things stem from this whole, this whole group here. Now, to add to that, Thomas Huxley was also, uh, I think, the president of the Royal Society in 1883, I believe. Okay, so he's also connected directly to the beginning of scientism by way of the Royal Society. We've done many studies on the Royal Society. That goes all the way back to of course, Bacon and the Atlantis, New Atlantis, Baconian science, the, the scientific elite, right? And here we are. Here we are with the new X Club, the real X-Men with Elon Musk at the helm. Let's read a little bit about this. This is a nice little excerpt from uh, James C. Ongurinu. PhD historian of science and religion. I just totally butchered that name. Forgive me. He takes a little excerpt from that book. It says, let's see, I pull this out here. It was an irony of which they seemed unaware, writes Barton, that the greatest symbolic achievement of the X Club was not the separation of theology from science, because that was a big issue at the time. Is it theological? Is it scientific? Right? It was the whole it was the whole, uh, almost the height of the Enlightenment era, the, the, the introduction to the progressive era, which is where we got genetic determinism, IQ tests, and of course, eugenics, right? So during this, this time, this was really the, the, the emerging scientist, scientistic transhumanist elite faction started here. Now, let's see. The X Club was not the separation of theology from science, but the conflation of science, church, and state in Darwin's burial in Westminster Abbey. Very, very important, guys. Very, very important. In the second paper, Barton rehearses some of the material found in the, pre in the previews paper. What is new and deeply intriguing is her emphasis that X-Club members formed alliances beyond professional science. Who remembers extra scientific organizations we've discussed, not years back, but maybe a year or two ago? Oh, who was that? Ellis, no Ellis Norbert, Norbert, I believe, out of his science, science and technology journals. The Sociology of Science and Technology, I believe, was Ellis Norbert Norton. I can't remember. Anyhow, you guys remember this concept of extra scientific organizations, and I was using that, that work to explain how early on in the 20th century, uh, groups, extra scientific, meaning unscientific, like Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, Carnegie and Mellon, these organizations started to fund scientific research. They started to infiltrate um, um, scientific research and university systems, and they started providing the funding for all projects. But there was a, there was a kicker there. there. There was a catch. The only things that were funded had to do with the political extra scientific, the political perspectives of those funding, say Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, etc. We see the exact same thing today. Nothing's changed. Nothing's new under the sun. I'm just giving you a little bit of the history. So that's exactly what she's describing here when she says, beyond professional science, they started to form relationships with banks, with corporations, with churches. Okay? 
is why before I was trying to explain to you the connection between the religious man, the culture man in Ye, the technocrat, the technologist, or the, the transhumanist in Musk, but the politician, the businessman, the corporatist in Trump. We are seeing the X-Club reintroduced, the real X-Men, in my view. Beyond professional science, they formed alliances with German Germanizing theologians, Christian socialists, humanitarian ethnologists, and liberals associated with John Stuart Mill. Aligned science with liberal forms in theology and a social policy. Do you see it? Do you see it? That's precisely where we're at now. Let me read that again. I know you guys are putting this together. They formed alliances, scientists, this is, technicians, right? Scientists formed alliances with German, Germanizing theologians, Christian socialists, humanitarian ethnologists, and, liberal associ and liberal, liberals associated with John Stuart Mill, aligned science with liberal forms in theology and in social policy, hence progressivism. This is the beginning of the scientific progressive elite right here, historically speaking, okay? Thomas Huxley, father of Aldous and Julian Huxley. See how it all works, okay? And these are just, I'm just taking you through basics. We're not going too deep. These are just basics to understand some historical uh, hallmarks or land, landmarks. Now, let's continue here. Indeed, commitments to naturalistic explanation and to melioristic social reform. Mm, science for social reform. That's what progressive technocratic uh, policy is. Okay. Their goal, the progressive movement's goal was to fix humanity through science. I know technocracy was an early 20s movement, but there's, it's deeper than that. Technocracy is more of a technocratic business movement. Goes, it's transhumanism is goes way back, right? I mean, you can go back to Leonardo's work and see transhumanism and his early designs. Okay, so I think transhumanism is a mere element of of human imagination in that we want to merge with, if not machines, say animals. Okay, you guys understand that. Um, Commit, commitments to naturalistic explanation and to melioristic so, social reform linked them to these groups. So progressivism is taking transhumanist technologies to fix humanity under the guise of social reform. That's all the progressive movement was. Social reform. But only through technology. We're seeing the same thing today. We're seeing social reform, but more importantly, now we're seeing public health reform through technology. Why? Because there's the body, biology. See, social reform, uh, social ideas, cultural ideas tend to do with ideas, right? Ideology. So, sound like a, that, 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 that sounded like, a, what's her name right there? Um, has to do with ideology, okay? So it's, it's uh, metaphysical. But see, once you add biology, that's when it becomes physical. That's when it becomes material. This gives you access to bodies, that's the difference. And that's where we're at now. We went from social reform to public health reform through technological intervention. This stuff goes way back. I'm trying to bring you back and showing you some history here. Again, this is an excerpt from the book by Burton. This, is a, this, this piece here is from Chicago University, but this is the book, The Club, The X Club, Power and Authority in Victorian Science by Ruth Barton. Okay, let me continue here. Several books in this area I've been recently paging through include Paul White's Thomas Huxley, uh, Making Man of Science. This is more than another biography of Huxley. It is an account of, what, of the way that a particular cultural identity, the Victorian man of science, was constructed through processes of negotiation and collaboration between naturalists such as Huxley and their families, colleagues, friends, and adversaries. Through a close reading of private, co private correspondences, White builds up a portrait of Huxley and his relationships with his wife, fellow men of science, educational reformers, clergymen, and so on. 
White provocatively depicts Huxley as a defender of high culture, even as an elitist. So it is my view that Thomas Huxley, though we understand his sons did many huge things technologically and culturally, Aldous more so in literature, uh, Thomas uh, more, more so, well, I guess they both worked in literature, but Thomas more so in, in transhumanist policy. Okay. But what we see in, in Thomas Huxley, their father, he was in a sense, as, as they would put it here, the Victorian man of science, this, this new liberal, i.e. progressive technocrat, i.e. Elon Musk. Let me read a little more. This is from another article. Uh, the British Empire knew that this emerging new paradigm would render both its maritime control of international trade as obsolete as its international program, usury and cash cropping. It was clear that something had to change dramatically, for if the empire could not adapt in response to this new paradigm, a new paradigm shift in science, merging uh, social policy, theology, false theology, and of course, scientism. It surely wouldn't soon perish. The task of reshaping imperial policy from a material force, right? approach of control to a more mental force, this is important. They go from science as a hard science, physical, conclusive, empirical science, to a mental force, science with a P, P-S-Y, okay? Where we're at now, we're not dealing with real, hard, material science. We're dealing with mental, uh, uh, socially engineered, uh, metaphysical science. It's, it's weird. What, it's models and, and projections, etc. Mental force of control was assigned to Thomas Huxley and the X Club. This club established the gilding scientific pr principles, and this was during the, uh, the Gilded Age, mind you, into into the progressive era. So we go from the Gilded Age to the progressive era. You know, the Gilded Age, the age of the aristocracy, you know, the, the robber barons, right? The big banks, the money, where, where all of this started to develop, started to develop with the X Club and of course the, the Royal Society and this new scientism that was developed merged with the banking system, merged with the corporation. The corporate and the science came together. And this is before Woodrow Wilson. It makes sense why, like say 15, 20 years later, Woodrow Wilson pretty much sells out the West to the uh, League of Nations, which started what we now are referring to as the United Nations. You see how all of this developed. Let's continue. This group established the gilding scientific principles of empire that were soon put into practice by two new think tanks known as the Fabian Society. Mm -hmm. We've been discussing them for years. And the Rhodes Scholar Trust, Cecil Rhodes, Milner Group, the conservative, quote unquote, right side of technocracy, opposed to the leftist, quote unquote, progressive Fabian side of technocracy. You have the Fabians, progressive. You have the Milner Group, conservative, quote unquote. Same bird, two different wings, pretending to be at war. Nothing new under the sun. Rhodes Scholar Trust, which I outlined in my three part series, Origins of the Deep State in North America. Huxley, who was famously known as Darwin's bulldog for relentless promoting Darwin's theory of natural selection, a theory, in, a theory in whose scientific merits he didn't even believe, soon decided that the group should establish a magazine, this is important, I'm going somewhere with this, to promote their propaganda. Do you guys know what that magazine was? I'll tell you here in a second, but that magazine almost uh, single-handedly pushed the entire convid scamdemic propaganda. Let me continue. Founded in 1869, the magazine was called Nature. Hmm. I'm sure you're all familiar, familiar with it because we were citing Nature all throughout the past several or at least two and a half years because they were putting out all of the, what some would argue, most scientific takes on the scamdemic. 
Nature and featured articles by Huxley and several X-Club members, the deeper purpose of the X-Club and its magazine, as outlined in a 2013 report entitled Hideous Revolution, the X-Club's Malthusian Revolution, eugenicists, uh, in science, was geared towards the redefinition of all branches of science around a statistical empiricist interpretation of the universe which denied the existence of creative reason in mankind or nature. Anti-nature anti-mankind. What does this sound like? Sounds like a data-driven epistemology, doesn't it? Yes. It renders all things, nature and man, to computer language. Ones and zeros. Science was converted from the unbounded study and perfectibility of truth to a mathematical sealed science of limits. Eventually, we're going to go all the way into the science of the science of limits and the limits to growth that eventually came out of, of course, Club of Rome. And that's the whole climate change angle. It's all connected, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be rolling it out for you. It's all here. It's going to take us some time, but we'll get there. Here's a nature article right here, just as an example. This is the nature article. This is the nature magazine, right? Still running full on today. Here we are. CV jabs and safety. What the research says, right? It's experts, right? Experts. Now. I want to show you something rather interesting here to connect even more dots. But instead of Thomas Huxley, now let's go to Aldous, his son. We discussed Julian a couple shows back when we talked about transhumanism and his introduction of UNESCO, which is a technocratic uh, social engineering and eugenicist program as well, connected to UNICEF, which aims for children. Now let's talk about Aldous. Not, we're not going to talk about Brave New World, but I want to show you a letter that he wrote to uh, George Orwell with regard to his work. If you think about it, they, their work was, of course, prescient, but uh, almost, uh, it, there was almost a conflict, a contrast between the two. You know, you have Orwell, who's like, we're going to have this very overbearing, dominant, austere culture, right? Like cell walls type of, of austerity, um, hindrance, uh, limiting, right? Uh, see, all this, Huxley was a bit different, quite the opposite. Uh, all this was like, no, we're going to give people freedom through, a, through a, a servitude of comfort. They're going to love pleasure such that we'll provide pleasure through a form of slavery, slavery that they can't even recognize. And many have said, yeah, we're more so in a brave new world, and I agree. But Aldous himself even predicted that and believed it so much he even wrote Orwell a letter. Let's look at the letter. Here's the original. This is off of one of my favorite websites, Internet Archive, just for some evidence, you know, receipts. Okay. So here's the original, very hard to read, um, kind of messy, not very together. Let's, let's go to Gizmodo because they've reproduced it. Okay. I just want to show you the original here. Yes, THX 1138. Yes, definitely one of the earliest ones. That was George Lucas's film project for or project for film school, I believe. Very, very prescient, very, very telling. One of the one of the good ones. If you want to go back, definitely. Yeah. Now let's look at the letter. Okay, I, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, actually, I can. I can read the whole thing. Yeah, it's not too long. Okay. Agreeing with all that critics have written of it, I need to tell you. Yet once more, how fine and how profoundly important the book is. May I speak instead of the thing with which the book deals, the ultimate revolution? The first hints of, philo of a philosophy of the ultimate revolution, the revolution which lies beyond politics and economics, and which aims at total subversion of the individual psychology and physiology. Mm, when I think about that, I think of mind and body. I think of social engineering by way of uh, psychological manipulation, but I also think of Manipulation physiologically through biotechnology. Let me continue. We're right here. Are to be found in the Marcus de Sade, who regarded himself as the continuator, the consummator of Robes, Robespierre and Bebeuf. I don't know if I pronounced that right. The philosophy of the ruling minority in 19, 1984 is a sadism. Okay, hold on. Where am I at here? Okay. 
sadism which has been carried to its logical conclusion by going beyond sex and denying it. Whether in actual fact the policy of boot on the face can go on indefinitely seems doubtful. See, Orwell was like, boot on the face is the future. He's like, no, it seems doubtful. My own belief is that the ruling oligarchy will find less arduous and wasteful ways of governing and of satisfying its lust for power. And these ways will resemble those which I described in Brave New World. I have had occasion, I have had occasion recently to take, to look into the history of animal magnetism and hypnotism. What do you think social media is? Let's continue. I have looked into the history of animal magnetism and hypnotism and have been greatly struck by the way in which for 150 years, the world has refused to take serious cognizance of the discoveries of Mesner. Huh. We spent many shows talking about Mesner. Braid, it, that was years ago, but you guys remember. Braid, Esdiel, and the rest. Partly because of the prevailing materialism and partly because of the prevailing respectability, 19th century philosophers and men of science were not willing to investigate the otter facts of psychology for practical men, such as politicians, soldiers, and policemen, to apply in the field of government, governmental, govern mind, right? Psychology. Thanks to the voluntary ignorance of our fathers, the advent of the ultimate revolution was delayed for five or six generations. Another lucky accident was Freud's inability to hypnotize successfully and his consequent disparagement of hypnotism. This delayed the general application of hypnotism to psychiatry for at least 40 years. But now psychoanalysis is being combined with hypnosis and hypnosis has been made easy and indefinitely extensible through the use of barbiturates, which induce a hypnoid and suggestible state in even the most recalcitrant subjects. Now, if you guys remember my work, um, How Media Shaped the Generations, if we refer to the last installment, Narcissist, um, Narcissist Narcosis, I go directly into this history of hypnosis and the mind movements of the, of the 70s, which are really just building off of work of Mesner and, say, Freud. So we've been, we've been talking about these things for those who are new. Plenty, plenty of content. Within the next generation, this is where it gets super juicy. Within the next generation, I believe that the world's rulers will discover that infant conditioning and narco-hypnosis, can you say op opiates, right? And narco-hypnosis are more efficient. Also, uh, THC, okay? Cocaine, right? Think about it, guys. ADHD medicines, all of these things are different forms of hypnotic pharmacological powers, right? It's no wonder we see so many young people being given these drugs, because they've had these ideas for generations. Hypnosis are more efficient as instruments of government. Wow, he's basically saying narcot narcotic hypnosis is more efficient as instruments of government. Now they have social media. They don't need the drugs as much anymore, guys. They really don't. They really don't need the drugs as much. They got social media, which is another form of hypnosis. Telehypnosis. Then clubs and prisons and that the lust for power can just as completely satisfied by suggesting people into loving their servitude as by flogging and kicking them into obedience. Mm, there it is. Super modernity is all about fun and pleasure and entertainment. Kicking them into, or should I say loving their servitude that's by flogging and kicking them into obedience. You don't got to kick anybody. You got to flog people. Just give them enough to be joyful and entertained with. Give them sugars. Give them syrups. And give them music, sound, song, and dance. Give them visuals. Give them iconographic imagery. To no end. That can scroll and roll and float and fly and exist at any time, any place, anywhere, all day, all night, 
There you have your new mesmerism. Yes, there you have it. In other words, I feel that the nightmare of 19, 1984 is destined to modulate into the nightmare of a world having more resemblance to that which I imagined in Brave New World. The change will be brought about as a result of a felt need for increased efficiency. There it is, guys. We harp on it all the time. Make things more efficient through technology. This is why everything's being rendered to number, to quantification, to ones and zeros, to algorithm, to patterns, to predictability. Efficiency. Beyond human nature. Beyond that which mankind and his ill ways, his stumbling blocks, his morality. Right? Morality isn't efficient. It's not. Computers are. Numbers don't lie, right? You can trust the numbers. You can trust the computer, right? Computers don't judge. Meanwhile, of course, there may be a large scale of biological and atomic war. I'm focusing on the biological. Because that's where we at. Bio-war. In which case we shall have nightmares of other and scarcely imaginable kinds. Written by Algis Huxley. Two, George Orwell in 1949. October, by the way. October. 